many people want to open up an office in Timbuktu. Every architect in the world has wanted to open an office in Paris, but the French don't like Americans to be designing their buildings very much, so they always close them back up after that partner opens the office. But places like Denver that we don't currently have an office, it becomes very attractive. Other cities in, in the Midwest, in Charlotte, North Carolina, you, these different satellites become very attractive. And now that we can work remotely, people want to start offices in a lot of different places. Well, one of the things we've learned is it costs practically nothing to open an office, but to close an office starts at a million dollars and goes up from there very quickly, quickly. My name is Mark Arlapage, and I'm joined by Patrick McLaney, FAIA, and former CEO of the international architecture firm, HOK. This is Build Smart. Patrick shares stories from his remarkable 50-year career at HOK, rising from junior designer to CEO of the company. With themes of leadership, finance, people, culture, and so much more, you'll find that there's a lesson in every episode. Welcome back to Build Smart. In our last episode, Patrick discussed the introduction of an investor into HOK, Kojima, one of the oldest and largest construction and real estate development companies in Japan. He also touched on some of the right ways and the wrong ways to grow your firm. If you haven't listened to that episode, I encourage you to go back and listen to all the episodes in order to hear Patrick's full story and insights into how to design a world-class architecture firm. In today's episode, Patrick discusses HOK's international expansion. He shares how things began to unravel for the firm, and he expands on his thoughts and examples of growth strategies for an architecture what firm. What was the Sinkoff strategy? Well, when, when Gio did retire and Jerry became HOK's CEO, uh, he had been thinking about a strategy for the firm for some time and had already anticipated that we needed to grow as a firm. His idea was, again, to turn from a, a good, very good national firm with a good reputation to an international firm with a stellar reputation. And he had three pieces to that strategy. One was to focus on clients. In the early days of HOK, with starting with Papa George Helmuth, the founder, the big thing was to win the job. And of course, we did. We, we won lots of jobs. but Jobs are given to us by clients. Those are people. And clients need to be well served. And Jerry's insight was, if you focus on the client instead of the job, you can build lifelong relationships. And a client can become not only a friend, but a repeat client. If you focus the right way, instead of just thinking about winning the next job. And I think that's a great insight. It was a, a really a revision of Helmuth's idea that you have to become friends with a client where friendships mean that you're confident, you, you trust each other. And if you can build that kind of relationship with a client, they'll be your friend as long as uh, both of you are still in the business. The second one was harder to get done. Jerry had seen the great growth of the HOK specialty design practices, healthcare, sports architecture, and aviation design. And had seen the struggles of different offices trying to fill in their own aviation or their own healthcare group or their own justice group. And his insight was the idea of the group is good, but they're organized improperly. Each group should be a firm wide group with perhaps people from different offices participating in it, but not groups in individual offices competing with each other basically for the same work. Uh, it makes no sense for HOK to have two offices doing healthcare work and fighting over the same clients. That's not what HOK is about. HOK's culture was built around collaboration on the inside allows HOK to compete better on the outside. Yeah, so that was a pretty significant shift Yes, to this idea because I remember you talking earlier about Gio's matrix and how every firm should have specialties. And that, that was sort of the foundation of that. And now uh, Jerry Sinkoff is coming along and saying, well, that's not really working as well as we had hoped. 
this is working better where we have one firm wide across the nation focusing on a specialty market. That's right. That did not go over well because the offices were organized as a template of the original founding office in St. Louis. They had a managing principle, a marketing principle, a design principle, and they stood on their own as far as fees and profits. So it was a, I'm from Los Angeles and I'm, if there's an airport in town, I want to do it. I don't want to have another office to an airport and leave me out of it. The structure of the firm with the multiple offices was in conflict with Jerry's idea that you'd somehow build a collaborative matrix where you would have groups like healthcare uh, working across the nation. And his template for this was a really simple one, a good one, HOK Sport. You'll recall that HOK Sport was brought into the firm with a mandate that they could do sports architecture across the country, even in an office, even in a city rather, when there was another HOK office, uh, because sports architecture demanded that the sports group be focused and excellent in that expertise. And uh, having somebody experiment on a new major league stadium didn't work. Well, Jerry's insight was, well, it didn't work for hospitals or airports either. Jerry told me once, if he could go back to the beginning of the firm and redesign the firm, he might well have established individual offices with focused design work, like the sport model. I personally don't think that works as well because, number one, not every marketplace is like the sports marketplace, which is highly consolidated with National Football League, Baseball League, and, and soccer and hockey and so on. And uh, when you get to things like healthcare or justice, the design expertise is needed, but there's also a great need for local connections, local involvement. So Jerry's idea was to do away with the HOK matrix where every office wants to duplicate the other and, and instead focus that uh, expertise in one or two offices, but have them join together, have the healthcare people in New York and in San Francisco join together and be one team. And we struggled with that through the rest of Jerry's tenure uh, and a good deal of mine. I could imagine it a very difficult thing to do, to take a firm that's been structured one way for many, many years as independent offices throughout the country, working pretty much on their own. They had You had central accounting, but each office was essentially running its own business. And now you're shifting that model pretty dramatically. And so you needed consensus for that to happen. And so that sounds like where the struggle came in. Yes. And consensus was difficult to find because the incentive for each office wasn't to collaborate. The incentive was to get and keep as much fee and profit possible. So collaborating sounded like kind of surrendering, giving up some of that fee. And so uh, until we changed how the, how the fee and profits were actually counted, we didn't make much of a dent in changing that. Yeah. Uh, what was the strategy for growth? Well, the strategy for growth was, again, Jerry had a big pot of money left over after Gail was retired, and he wanted to use that to grow. So he went shopping. <laughs> CRS, Caudill, Rollett, and Scott in Houston, Texas, was a firm with a good reputation. I always had called or thought of CRS as the thinking man's architect. They had a strategy for innovation in how they did the work. They would actually assemble a team, go to the client's offices, spend a week, and drill down into whatever the issue or the problem was that the client had to solve. Not just programming a building, but figuring out what the client's real needs were. And they actually patented the term problem seeking so they were attractive to clients that had big, complex problems that were, were connected to uh, how they lived and worked. But CRS made a mistake. They decided to go public. They organized to sell stock in the American Stock Exchange, and they got a bunch of money for it, and they used it to grow. Well, if you're in a public stock exchange, like the American New York Stock Exchange or, or wherever, you have shareholders that are, have no connection to your company. And the shareholders began to demand, we want growth every year, we want more profits, we want dividends. And so they were riding, I call it ride the tiger. They were riding the tiger. They bought 
another firm, the Serene Company, which was a big industrial design firm. So it became CRSS. And ultimately, the CRSS company morphed itself into a bigger company that had as its business designing power plants, gas-fired power plants for peak load. What does that mean? They're in Texas. Texas just had a big cold snap and people ran out of electricity. Well, their idea at that time was to build power plants that ran on natural gas that would only be used when there was peak power demand because the utility companies would pay top dollar. And once that idea permeated through the CRSS organization, they wanted to focus their full attention on just that kind of work. Well, by then, the little design part of the, the original CRS architects was thought of as kind of an awkward appendage to this big power plant company. And they wanted more capital. They wanted to raise capital to buy more power plants and offer them up to the utility companies. So they set out notice that CRS is for sale. Jerry Sinkoff heard about it. and Jerry called me. Several of us went to Houston to meet CRS. We met them in their old headquarters, which was called the White House. Houston is tabletop flat, but there are a few bayous that reach into the city from the Gulf. The White House was built on the side of a bayou, and it was what I call an upside down building. The street level was just a parking deck. You got in an elevator and went down, and their offices were under the parking deck with this beautiful view out over a green tree laden bayou. The only problem was that sometimes when it flooded, they got wet too. Uh, but anyway, we met them and found that the people in CRS, the designers, the engineers, the architects, were really good people. They were waiting for somebody to rescue them from this monster that CRSS had turned into, which didn't fit anymore. And so they welcomed us with open arms. And uh, we had been warned by some of the employees at the CRS office, they're going to offer you the White House, but don't take it because it floods when there's a flood in Houston. So after meeting them, Jerry Sinkoff invited me to go meet their CFO, who was the person handling the sale. So we left the White House, came up out of the bayou, and walked across the street to a great big glassy building, which was the CRSS headquarters. Met the CFO, who in no uncertain terms made it clear that he wanted to make a quick sale. So Jerry had already figured out what he thought we should pay. He made an offer that was accepted on the spot. Finally, the CFO said, and would you like to buy the White House too? <laughs> So we said, well, no thanks. He said, well, okay, you can stay in the White House until I sell it, but then you'll have to move. So within a couple of months after buying CRS, they in fact sold the White House to somebody. By then we had the office reorganized as HOK Houston and leased a space in Williams Tower down by the Houston Galleria up on the 30th floor or so, up in the sunshine and the, and the air. The people in the office loved it. They said, we were reborn. And CRS, from the very beginning, that office became a very strong player in the HOK network, HOK Houston. So it was a great purchase. Second one was a firm in London. By this time, HOK had a small office in London that was working to design this shopping center in Glasgow, Scotland. But HOK was viewed as outsiders, as Americans. And in the UK, people like to work with British architects. So the office figured out that what they needed to do was merge with another UK firm to give themselves a patina of being a UK firm and uh, a firm that had that was staffed and led by British leaders instead of Americans. And so they found Cecil Denny Hyten. And Cecil Denny Hyten and HOK London were both about the same size. They were both less than 50 people. They had a series of meetings. They both agreed they liked each other. Jerry used his pocketbook to buy Cecil Denny Hyten, and the firm blossomed into HOK London. Cecil Denny Hyten, uh, in particular John Denny, uh, had very good connections with the central government in London. 
And so HOK immediately got work and became known almost within a few years as a good old line British firm. And HOK London is uh, still there today and one of my favorite offices because I love to visit London. The third, I touched on this before, but I'll touch on it again. It's good to have money and it's good to have money to buy things, but be careful what you want. So when Jerry Sinkoff sent Larry Self to London, Larry actually worked out of our office there, but he was constantly in Europe looking for opportunities to open new offices. And we did. We opened an office in Warsaw and another one in, in Moscow and in, and in Berlin and a couple of other places in the Netherlands. All of them eventually failed because we didn't pay attention to the what's it like on the ground. If you're going to expand like that, you can't just do a sweeping overview. If you're going to open in Germany, you've got to go to Germany and really understand the culture and the language and the, the way business is practiced there. And all of that was done superficially. So all of those offices eventually failed. And to this day, HOK does work in Europe, but has no permanent offices on continental Europe. So all the European offices failed because the culture wasn't established properly. Yes, and I'll add one more thing, Mark. It's a little bit like it's, it's fun and easy to get pregnant, <laughs> but it's really expensive after the baby comes. It's fun and easy to start an office, and you can do it with uh, just a few dollars or a few euros or a few pounds. But if you want to unwind an office and close it down, pay the bills off and buy out your rent and so on, it's expensive. And we had to do this many times because the expansion that we embarked upon was not always as well thought out. I can imagine when you have a full bank account of Kojima money, it's very easy to go shopping and just make those big purchases and not do all the due diligence that you need to because you have all the money that you need to buy whatever you want. Yes, um, that rapid growth led to uh, all kinds of issues in the future. So there were clouds on the horizon, although as we were growing, it wasn't always apparent. But if you took a little closer look, there were seeds of difficulty throughout the firm by now. What were some of those signs of trouble? Well, one is that many of the offices that were started in not only in Europe, but in the U.S. Uh, were underperforming. You know, opening an office means that you have to have at least three really good people to have a permanent good office. And if you don't get the work, or if you don't manage the work properly, or if you, if you don't develop a good design reputation or produce the work properly, it's a funny thing about that. Clients don't like to pay their bills on time when they feel they're being underserved. So a lot of these offices were there and they were working, but they weren't producing. They weren't making a profit. And even when they did, somehow some decided that, well, collecting money wasn't part of the job. I earned it, and I turned it over to the accountants, and the accountants are somehow going to collect it. Well, the accountants send the invoice, but they don't actually have the relationship with the client that the principals or the project manager or the project designer have. So we began to regular, have regular issues with certain offices, and it also created a great frustration and some anger on the part of offices that always performed well. Why? Well, because profits from the profitable offices had to go to prop up the underperforming offices, meaning the whole firm made less money. At the end of the year, the bonus pool was smaller. So if you're going to start an office, you need to have some ground rules and you need to have some common understanding of what a performance needs to be for an office. And people were making what I call rookie mistakes. People were put in charge of an office, and the first thing it would do is, until controls were put in place, they would go out and rent a nice expensive office space and put expensive furniture in it. So we were stuck with all that capital cost up front without having enough work. The office might have looked good, but there was no work. In addition to underperforming offices, offices began to compete with each other, not always in terms of geography, but in terms of building type. I have a healthcare group in my office and you have one in yours and we both see if we can 
get to a client first to put the HOK credentials and some embarrassing things happened. Huh. I can remember hearing one story from my San Francisco office that called on a client. I think it was healthcare. And uh, the, they met, presented their credentials, including giving the client their business cards. He said, HOK, where do I know that? Oh, yes. There were some people in here just the other day from HOK. And he pulled his drawer open and there was business cards from HOK in New York or someplace. So that was wheel spinning. It was friction inside the firm, the collaboration inside the firm, so that we can compete outside the firm began to break down because why? The people that were running these new offices didn't have the HOK culture. No one taught it to them. Right. And if you don't teach it to people, if you don't nurture it, if you don't insist on HOK culture, it will change. It will become different. That seems to be a recurring theme throughout this podcast series of of the HOA culture being the thing that, that makes it successful. And then also the lack of that HOK culture being the thing that's causing it to fail. And so can you talk about that? Yes. When we start a new office, Mark, anybody starts a new office, how do you assure that the values, the, the culture, what, what is it that's important to our firm that we all share in common? How do you inculcate that into a new office? Well, the best way is I think the example that we had in San Francisco where Bill Valentine and I and several others from St. Louis moved to the new city and began a new office. It's slower that way because we were the outsiders, uh, the newbies uh, in San Francisco, but we knew what HOK culture was. So San Francisco grew up as an office with that culture intact. But there are other offices uh, where people were not brought from St. Louis, but hired on the spot. We, we made that mistake ourselves when we opened HOK Los Angeles as a branch of San Francisco. And we thought it was a really good idea to hire local people because they knew the marketplace and they did, but they had no idea what HOK was, was about, what we stood for. And once that begins to happen, you got all these different offices and people saying, well, that's not how we work here. That's not our way. How do you pull out together that takes leadership? And I think the leadership uh, has to come from the, the top of the firm. Gio was able to knock heads together more than one occasion saying, that's not how we do it. And when Gio said it, especially since he was the owner of the firm, controlling owner, people tended to snap too. But with Jerry and his colleagues, including my colleague, Bill Valentine, it was a suggest mentality instead of telling mentality. If I suggest that it's a really good idea if you collaborate, if people are not oriented to collaborating anyway, they're not going to do it. You finally have to draw a line in the sand and say, this is the way it is. If you don't really want to be this way, you don't belong in this company. That did not happen at this point. Why? Well, because some of these people were viewed as really, you know, if we really make so-and-so unhappy, they might just leave and they'll take their clients with them. So there's a fear that comes into this too, that the fear of alienating people. It's a bit like raising kids, Mark. If you have a wayward child, I'm sure some of your listeners do. I was probably one myself. How much discipline do you impose versus letting them figure things out themselves? And it's every parent's dilemma and job to figure it out for each child. And they're all different. So in HOK, we, I think, erred on the side of being too light with our touch. And uh, all of that would finally build up to a great big set of problems later on. But the, the signs of it were everywhere by now. Yeah, it's, it's sounding like uh, there's lots of growth and growing big, growing fast, uh, and having lots of growing pains as, as you make that transition to uh, the larger firm. Um, so we'll talk about that in future episodes. Um, the lessons, the lessons for this episode, what should we take away today? Well, yes, I think there are probably some pretty good ones here. One is it's great to grow to serve clients, but not at the expense of neglecting quality. So you have to grow. You have to be as good as you were when you were smaller, if not better as you grow. Don't ever sacrifice quality. That's the one thing you carry with you. That's just your reputation. 
And the other one is that if you don't nurture your company culture, it's a living thing. It doesn't just automatically happen. And nature abhors a vacuum. And if you don't have that culture, other kinds of things will happen. And I always called it in the absence of something positive, the dark side of the force will come in. There will be negativity that comes in. You've got to work at that. If you don't work at it to keep it, it will eventually disappear. You'll lose it. And then to recover it again is a great big job. But at the moment, we're not in the abyss. We're just uh, having growing pains and signs of trouble and a certain amount of internal grumbling about why can't those guys in those other offices make some profit or why are they poaching on my clients? But it's, so far, it hasn't become a crescendo, but that's coming. To continue the story, come back next week for the next episode of Built Smart. Patrick gets a firm wide role and aims to ensure profitability for the firm. He will share his simple financial metrics and discusses how you can adapt them for your architecture firm. What I found was that people that were running the offices that were responsible for financial performance didn't understand actually what they were to do. A little simple example, an office is not making a profit. I would have a meeting with the office leadership and say, you need to cut your cost. The first thing they would do is look at office supplies. Maybe we can cut down on office supplies. Buy fewer pencils, a little less paper. Maybe we can use both sides of the paper next time. And uh, it was clear to me that they didn't understand uh, the proportion of things. And so the truth of what you could afford in the way of total employees in an office was missing. So I went to St. Louis and I sat with the CFO and the controller. And we took probably the better part of a week. I said, there's got to be some way to get an, an idea about how many people can I afford to have in my office if my fees are $1, $100, or a million dollars. And I said, you know, don't give me this direct personnel expense stuff. What does that mean? It's an artificial construct made up for the accountants. What, what I know in my office is I know what people are paid. I know what their salary is. So can we please get a ratio of how much salary I can afford based on how much fee I'm earning? And after a week, we came up with a number. Thank you for listening. To read along and see illustrations and personal photos that accompany this series, get Patrick's book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm. I encourage you to go grab a copy today and follow along as we continue the story. It's available now at gablemedia.com slash buildsmartbook. This podcast is a Gable Media production and is produced by Demetrius Lynch Jr. Gable Media is the home of curated thought leadership for an audience dedicated to building a better world. You can listen in, subscribe, and find more content like this from our network partners at gablemedia.com. That's G-A-B-L media.com.